Awesome, great. So we want to keep moving through. Thank you guys so much for all those great questions. We're now going to let Leah Shapiro take the wheel and talk to us today about how your pitch can hit a high note with the media. So thank you, Sarah. For being here. Thank you, Kathleen. That was awesome. I'm so excited to be here today and talk about um, pitches. So a little bit about me, um, before I became the editing, content creation, and PR specialist at JB Media um, about a year ago, I was the editor-in-chief of the Laurel of Asheville magazine, which is a monthly arts and culture publication in Western North Carolina and a little bit in upstate South Carolina. And since then, um, I've continued to contribute to national and regional online publications, such as Travel and Leisure and Our State. I've also written the annual SoCon basketball tournament for five years now, um, which tells folks what to do when they visit Asheville for those games. So that's just to say that I'm super invested in Asheville's tourism and the promotion of Western North Carolina. So, <laughs> You're planning an event, you're promoting your organization and business, and you want people to know about it, right? Journalists, reporters, and other influencers receive hundreds of pitches a week. How can you make the story of your region, attraction, or event something they'll want to share with their audiences? How can you make your business organization stand out to the media? Well, let me tell you a little story. Once upon a time, uh, when I worked at the magazine, Kathleen, who you just met, worked at JB Media doing outreach for her clients, and I was on her media list. This was one of the first correspondences between Kathleen and myself in 2013, and Kathleen was trying uh, to get some PR for JB Media's client, Dog Tag Art, which is a dog tag company. Um, so she sent me this um, pitch uh, about a story between uh, a man proposing, a man and his, you know, now fiance, um, and how he proposed to her using dog tags. It was a pretty cute story. And a reciprocal and beneficial journalist and PR specialist relationship blossomed. Her story fit perfectly in a monthly column that we had. And I just so happened to be looking for stories about romance in Western North Carolina when she emailed me. I ended up emailing her pretty often after this to see if she had any more romantic leads because as you can see, we ended up publishing the story. She actually ended up feeding me lots of story ideas over the next couple years because she got to know what kind of things I was looking for and what I didn't want. She earned my trust and she never took it personally when I said, I can't do this pitch right now. Because it's not personal. Whether or not your story is picked up is dependent on so many factors that you may not know about. Perhaps the publication has already published a lot of stories recently on your particular topic and they're giving it a rest. Maybe you just got picked up by a different publication and this one doesn't wanna just repeat the same story to their readers. They might file it away though, so keep that in mind that sending you know, someone evergreen content and content that's not tied to a specific time is a really important thing. And you know, Gary and Heather lived happily ever after and so did me and Kathleen. So let's pretend, since my um, presentation's called How to Hit a High Note, um, I wanted to give a little extended metaphor. Um, let's pretend you're a country music singer. Um, how can you be like Kathleen and develop relationships with reporters and influencers? How can you create a pitch that will catch a journalist's ear and make them interested in your story? So I distilled the pitch process down into this idea. Um, you have an organization or business, likely in the tourism and travel industry. So let's say in this make-believe world, you're a country music singer and you're hoping to get more people to share your music. So you're getting ready to play a show at the Tumblrweed, which is a popular honky-tonk bar and grill um, based on the, the fabulous Tumblr website. Um, your audience are current fans who came to see you or potential fans who were just hanging out at the bar. In this metaphor, your audience is composed of journalists, influencers, and other members of the media. Some know your work and some don't. How do you make your show as successful as possible? In other words, how do you get the media to notice you, get interested in what you're doing, and share your music? 
how do you make a good impression and ultimately further your bright future as a world-renowned country music sensation? So to prepare for this show, you know, you're gonna put together a set list, which in this metaphor is you will select journalists and influencers to pitch to. Number two, you'll practice, which in this case, you'll write and tweak your pitches to express the story you're trying to tell. Number three, you'll do a sound check, which is proofreading. Number four, you'll perform or appeal to the media and hit send. And number five, encore or no encore? Did you get a reply or do you nudge? So number one, create your set list. What you're going to share with your audience needs to fit within your genre. You're a country music singer. Stick to it. Don't bust out those punk rock songs. That is, make sure you're reaching the right journalists with the right, uh, with the right message. You don't want a tomato or something thrown at you. If you're a female entrepreneur, don't reach out to a men's magazine. If you're looking to promote an event that takes place in two weeks, don't reach out to a monthly magazine that's already on the shelves. Stick with the hits. Research and create a media list. A media list is a contact sheet of journalists, influencers, etc., who you want to reach out to. They write for audiences that overlap with the people you're trying to reach. This is a uh, very zoomed out version of a complex media list. So I broke it down on the right and told you a couple things that you can include in your media list that will be really helpful when you're trying to pitch story ideas. So next, you get ready to send them a press release and pitch. I'm just gonna go over what these two things are or what the press release is very briefly before going on to the pitch. So the press release is a PR announcement that lets the media know of company development and news. It provides basic information on the business, contact info, and it includes applicable quotes. This example is from the Village Potters that got sent to me last year. Um, they're having an event. So as you can see, it includes basic information on their business, where they're located, who they serve, what they provide. It's their elevator pitch. If, they're, you know, if the media is going to take the story and run with it, you know, without even emailing you back, they should have everything they need in this case. That's also to say that if the date of your event changes or gets canceled, you should let everyone who you reached out to know of this change. They don't want to publish incorrect information and you don't want them to. Now the pitch. So different than the press release, the pitch is a suggested story idea. It's more personalized and less formal than a press release. This pitch is from a publicist for an author, and it fit perfectly with our monthly book feature. I ended up publishing an article on this because it was timely and applicable to what we print. We only featured local authors, so it was really important that her first line says Asheville author at the very beginning. She also tied this to an event which was far enough in the future that we could promote it. It was sent July 27th, which is when we were finalizing September stories. This event was in September, so it was really perfect. <clears throat> the pitch tells a story. It is not an advertisement. If you don't have a story, you don't have a pitch. If Kathleen had just emailed me, hey, dog tag art is a cool local business that makes personalized dog tags, I would have totally ignored that email. That's an ad, that's a sales pitch. It doesn't have a story that's relevant to my audience. I likely would have even forwarded her email to the sales manager as someone who might want to advertise in the magazine. But what she did was send me a story idea that had romance and intrigue, and it fit perfectly into a monthly column that we had. It was a story and not just a promotion of a business's services. So number two, practice. So these are tips for pitches. Your body is, I'm sorry, your pitch is usually in the body of the email. The press release is usually attached or copied, I'm sorry, attached or copied and pasted below the pitch. A good subject line is key. It should leave nothing to the imagination. Make it timely. Are you writing about a new program, new product, new partnership, upcoming event, company milestone? Are you looking for an article or just a calendar entry? Think like a journalist. Who is your target audience? How does this message affect their readers? Why would people care? What's the point? Avoid huge blocks of text, y'all. Journalists don't wanna read a lot. Bullet points are your friend. Look at what's going on in your industry. If you can connect what you're doing to a larger picture, that's key. And you might have to share the article with other people in your industry, but you're really just bringing each other up and bringing it to the attention of your audience. 
there are some um, links you can go to that help you find out what people are searching. Um, help a reporter out is a really great tool and you get daily emails about um, things that journalists are looking for in real time basically and you can reply to them and hopefully get featured in one of their stories and lastly be kind and approachable um, make your make sure your tone is direct but not overly confident don't use that fancy language give your contact info uh, for for web for email addresses and numbers that you'll actually respond to um, I recently did a freelance article and I reached out to a ton of businesses with questions um, while I was on a really tight deadline and only a small percentage got back to me on time. So the ones that didn't really weren't given an opportunity to get a larger mention in the story. Um, develop relationships with your reporters and um, you can do that by following them on social and really getting to know their beats. Really avoid what's, what's known in the industry as spray and pray PR, which is mass pitches. They're super spammy. Personalize pitches when possible. Tailor it to what, um, is, you know, what the journalist usually writes about, such as, hi, Leah. <coughs> Sorry. Hi, Leah, I loved your last article about blank. Um, Sorry, I need to cough. I get so choked up. Um, <clears throat> I've received pitches with no greeting that I know are likely BCC'd to dozens of people. Oh gosh. <clears throat> Media outlets would rather not publish stories that you'll find in every magazine. They know their readers expect to find unique things and that's why people are reading them. Oh my gosh, I've also had emails sent to me and I can see the full list of people CC'd. And I'll actually just copy and paste that into a Word document and know who other contacts are in the media. And um, I once got an email called Dear Sirs and I signed it Madam Leah and I rejected it immediately. So make sure you know the gender of whoever you're writing to. Sound check. Ask someone you trust to read your pitch and press release. Uh, make sure there aren't any typos, but more importantly, make sure your story is interesting. A good friend or a colleague who you trust will tell you whether or not your story is what people want to write about. Make sure your website's up to date. If it doesn't say what you do on it, you need to have it say that ASAP. Consider a page dedicated to past press and include a media kit on there. It makes you look a lot more professional. And be sure you're sending the pitch at a time when journalists are more likely to read it. I recommend Tuesdays and Wednesdays around 2 p.m. as kind of a, an industry standard. And definitely avoid weekends or after hours. <clears throat> All right, it's showtime. It's time for you to interact with your audience. Create an ambiance that reflects you and the vibe. Build relationships and earn trust with the press. Stay focused under pressure. Don't go on long tangents in your email. Visuals are super important. Just like a country singer on stage, uh, make sure that your visuals are on point. Make sure you have high-res imagery that you can provide members of the press at a moment's notice. Be pithy. You don't want to be on stage for six hours. Just like you shouldn't email, uh, email journalists on several different emails, contact them on LinkedIn, Facebook message them, tweet at them, and call them. They should have an email out there on the interweb that they would prefer to receive info from. Encore? It's recommended that you reach out again in two weeks after your original pitch, just in case it got lost in the shuffle. But after that, if you don't receive a response, move on. If the audience is applauding, however, they want more. Make sure you respond promptly to journalists who ask you follow-up questions. Remember y'all, even if you don't hear back as often as you'd like, you're still a rock star. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions that you may have, and I really appreciate your attention today. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so one thing I just want to uh, talk about, because this actually came up with Kathleen as well, is you know, both of you mentioned the importance of really understanding who you're talking to and who you're reaching out to. So I just wanted you to maybe share, you know, what do you suggest when people are kind of putting together that media list? 
Um, how do they find that information? How do they know more about the demographics of a magazine or a newspaper or, you know, who those people are really speaking to from an audience perspective? Can they just Google it? You know, what's their best process for kind of trying to research who to reach out to and then to make sure that the publication or the influencer that they're contacting has really got an audience they want? Sure. So um, what I find the best thing to do in terms of reach and figuring out what the rules are at each magazine, or I'm sorry, each publication, whether it's an online uh, blog or a print magazine or newspaper, is go on their website because chances are they do have a dedicated section on contact us. And they, a lot of them put a lot of time and effort into saying, here's what we want, here's what we don't want, here's to reach out to. You know, if you send us this, we won't respond. And um, that's a great way to figure that out. Some uh, media even publish their editorial calendars and show upcoming themes for their issues. And you can kind of fit in your story into that theme. So, you know, if it's a local Asheville publication, it might have a special arts and crafts issue. And if you're an artist, you need to, you know, get a pitch together and try to get it in um, in a timely fashion for that. Um, one thing I do is also I find articles, you know, for PR clients, we might have a JV Media. I'll find articles that are similar to what they are, t their topic is or their industry is. And I'll see who wrote that and see if they're a contributor, where they're a contributor at, and if they have some leeway in deciding um, if stories get published on that medium. So I will kind of, you know, follow the trail, as it were, to figure out um, how to reach them. And people will usually be pretty direct because nobody wants a bunch of emails they can't use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So just to throw something else out there that Jessica shared on the chat as well, um, is that she's actually saying she goes to the library sometimes and just flips through tons of magazines to just learn about what publications are out there. And I think that's a really um, simple, great idea, you know, to just look into things and do that piece. And that's something that Dr. Rader, who teaches in our program, talks about, which is that listening piece. So especially with the kind of work that both of you are doing, and you mentioned this with Instagram as well, you know, looking out there, searching the hashtags, searching for things in Cherokee and just seeing what's there, what kind of photos, what kind of images. And I just want to reiterate how important that I think that is before you jump into either of these, you know, kinds of strategies is to spend at least a little bit of time really doing that sort of research up front to say, this is what we see is already out there. This is what we see people are responding to, um, you know, because if you don't do that, then you don't know there's a monthly column that's romance oriented, you know, if you haven't taken the time. And that's always going to make your pitch, I think, a little bit stronger and more relevant. So we've got a couple questions coming in. The first question is from Trey, and it is, when is too little info a good thing in a pitch, like a tease? Or do you want to give the receiver of the pitch everything all at once? So like, how do you gauge when you're crossing the line into TMI for the people that you're outreaching to? Any suggestions? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so teases are a no-no. No one's going to put in any effort when they read your email to figure out stuff that you're not saying. They just don't have the time. So um, I think, you know, I think you can probably sum up what you need to say in two brief paragraphs. Um, I would make sure that whatever you are trying to get out of them is at the beginning of the email. And um, I would make it so that your press release has the who, what, where, why, when, and your pitch is really just catered to them and their needs, and it's pretty short. That answers your question. Yeah, and Trey, let us know if that doesn't answer your question, but I feel like that's exactly you know what I think is in line with what Justin and I kind of present typically. I also think you know one of the things we talk about in the institute classes is simply making sure when you send that email that it's if you've got a press release, just link to it, you know, or even maybe put it lower down in the body of the email, but don't add too many attachments to things or expect people to be clicking on documents and opening them. They really kind of want to just be able to scan the email, get your point. They will know whether or not it's relevant and they will respond appropriately. So um, essentially, I think you want to just kind of condense everything down. And if there's extra information, having just those quick links where they can go look at it um, or kind of making that a little bit, I think, you know, kind of lower down in the 
in the email makes a little more sense. Do you agree? That yeah, I definitely agree. And if you can get a warm handoff by anyone that you know at that outlet, whether it's a salesperson or another writer, um, try to do that. If you can get any, it's all about who you know in this world. And if you can get anybody to give you a warm handoff to the editor that you need to talk to, that's always a great foot in the door that they'll actually read mm -hmm. it. Yeah, I actually always tell the story about how when I first moved uh, to Asheville and I started my very first company in 2003, um, Jason Sanford was the business editor over the Asheville Citizen Times and he now runs the Ash Vegas blog and I literally like hunted him for two years <laughs> and very very nicely and very like softly every like once a quarter I'd be like Jason don't you want to have lunch with me but I mean it literally took me like over two years to get him to just like have a meeting with me after that, it was awesome because once we kind of established that we liked each other, he was much more willing to like answer my emails and interact, but he had so many people constantly outreaching to him. You know, there was just no way to kind of answer everyone or entertain everyone's ideas. So he was slowly getting like, who's going to be able to feed me a lot of good ideas that'll be, you know, well put together, save me time, all of that stuff. But I think had I known somebody who could have said, hey, Jason, you should meet Sarah, I probably could have saved myself a lot of time. And I had to just be patient and work up to it. Um, the other question that we have is from Cassie, and it's, do most publications have statistics on their readership and will they share? Or do they kind of keep that private you know, information? Um, I feel like that's something they share for people interested in advertising. Yes. Um, and they will have press packets for, I'm sorry, they will have sales advertising packets with that information. But if, if uh, you know, if you're not interested in advertising, it might be a little misleading to ask for that. But um, they do have, usually have that available because they're trying to sell spots in their publication. Yeah, and that's, I think, something in our program, Kimberly Daggerhart has taught a lot of our PR classes over the years. And she often suggests that you go ahead and whenever you can download those advertising kits, because a lot of times they're going to break down at least demographics, possibly locations, give you like topics, they'll even outline kind of if especially if it's monthlies or something that's you know, not happening every single day or every week, it's going to outline really what are the topics of each month. So when you're pitching, you're not pitching a story that has nothing to do with the theme of that particular mm -hmm. month. Um, and so, yeah, Cassie, I see your other comment here, you know, about learning more about the audiences and knowing which media outlets are the best. So I think those kits are probably one of the best ways that you can, you know, look into that. The other thing I want to throw out as a potential idea is these days, lots of publications are on social media. So almost every magazine, journal, you know, blog, anything of real value is going to have some sort of social media presence where they're distributing and promoting their content. And so a lot of times I'll also get onto those social media sites and just see what's going on. Um, and, you know, Facebook is a great example because I can put into my Facebook pages to watch inside of uh, my Facebook insights. I can put in different media outlets that I want to follow and I can see how much they're posting, how much engagement they're getting. And I can't see all sorts of details about, you know, their audience necessarily. But again, that listening piece of just seeing like who's commenting on stories, how many people are doing it. Is it like real chatty and talkative or are people pretty quiet? You know, which out of all the posts I see on their timeline for the last week or month, you know, which articles were really kind of standing out and getting a lot more engagement than others. That lets me know a little bit about the priorities of the readership. And even though I know Facebook is only going to be kind of one little piece of the pie of a representation of their audience, I still feel like sometimes that listening piece can tell you, you know, what kind of people um, that particular publication is attracting and how they're responding to things. Um, I even see that on Instagram a lot with media now too, especially because a lot of publications have great photos, you know, all that stuff. And so if you get on there and take a look at what's going on, it just gives you more insight into that. So hopefully Cassie, that helps you figure out how you can dig in a little bit more to learning about, you know, the audiences of the publications to really qualify whether or not it's right for you. I think, one of the things that's true about PR is that it's time consuming. Um, and in addition to taking a lot of time, you get a high percentage of no response or potential rejection. So, you know, Kimberly always says in classes that you just have to know it's not about you and it's okay. And that like, she's like, I get rejected hundreds of times a week and it's fine. You know, so I know from talking to students in the past, 
don't get discouraged. You know, if a publication's not responding, maybe it's just not right the right place to put your energy. So exploring where your energy is better spent might be the next step forward. Um, and I'm curious to know, you know, if you if someone's outreach to a publication four or five, six times and they're really not getting a response or they're getting that no, do you have kind of an endpoint where you're like, all right, we're not gonna try to outreach to these people anymore? Or do you you know, just kind of keep scheduling it and keep reaching out, keep trying to make it relevant. From the PR standpoint? Yeah. Um, we well, usually just don't get a response. Mm -hmm. um, so then you don't have anyone say, like, stop emailing me. <laughs> um, I don't That's know. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, I didn't know if there's any, like, giving up points where you can say, all right, I'm not going to keep doing this anymore. If you have, like, a contact who had responded to you in the past and it's more personalized and then they don't respond to you, you know, there is an element of, like, leave them alone kind yeah. of a thing. Yeah. So I, I would be sensitive to that. Yeah, I kind of feel that way personally. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm all about having lofty goals. And, you know, if you really want to get into a national publication, like, I think you should stick to it for a while and pitch a number of different things. But I know for some clients, I often say, like, all right, we've been pitching these guys for two years whatever we're doing, they don't view it as relevant. Like we have a contact, we're getting through, but they're never kind of saying yes or really responding with positive. So again, like really having that point where you gotta invest your time and energy, I think, smartly, uh, especially when you're a smaller company, you've got lower budget, lower time and resources. So I think just keeping that in mind, but that lends itself back to that tracking sheet and really knowing who you're reaching out to and then charting when are they responding and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I know we are right at the end. Um, we've got one more question I want to answer from Cassie, which is, how do you determine if something should be presented as a pitch versus a press release? And you kind of touched on this. But can you just talk about like the goal of each of those things? Sure. Yeah. So um, your pitch is uh, like it's it's like your personalized plea to this person who is on the other end of the the computer it's saying like hi Kathleen I saw that you recently published a story on green burial sites and you know um, they offered this perspective well it's interesting because I um, I do this element of green burial and it's really not getting a lot of coverage um, I thought your readers would be really in I, you know I know that that was a really popular article I thought your readers might be interested in this aspect of it and, and then your press release would say like, here's my product, like here's my elevator pitch on what I do, here's my contact information, you know, here's just like the facts. And the pitch was really like geared toward Kathleen, geared toward her audience, and it was very personalized. And so your press release, well, you can send that to lots of people, your pitch, you really should personalize and change from person to person. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think that's a great answer because that really is the true difference. The pitch needs to be to the person that you're actually talking to. Your press release is going to be broader. And like you said, it's going to contain information that everyone needs if they decide to run with the story. Mm -hmm. But the pitch is where I think you're going to be able to sell your readers want this because of ABC, mm -hmm. right? And make it really clear. So thank you guys again for all of your questions. If you have any additional questions, you can chat them in, uh, but we are right at one o'clock. If you have anything else that you want answered, please feel free to send it in and I will answer it. Um, you can also reach me at Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, at jbmediagroupllc.com. So if you have any other questions for Leah and Kathleen, I'm glad to take those by email or in the chat, and then we'll get back to you with answers. But in the meantime, thank you all so much for being here. And don't forget to tell your friends and colleagues about the first Wednesday of the month that they can join us anytime for the JB Media Digital Drop-In and have a great rest of your week.